service today actually complimenting pastor, but now it just seems like I'd be brown nosing, so <laughs> does it any other time? But <laughs> actually, um, I, I was talking with Lexi, I think it was Thursday or Friday, and um, we were kind of just bouncing back and forth some church stuff, and then I asked her how her foot was doing, and she shared something with me that just burst in my spirit because it is what I was going to segue into for my sermon today. So I asked her if she would share in your own words, kind of because people don't know the backstory of what happened. Um, <laughs> and you're dancing, right? <laughs> 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 she tripped over her own feet. This area is, yeah. yeah, so just kind of share what you told me and hit that one point, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I recently broke my foot around like two weeks ago, two week anniversaries tomorrow. <laughs> but it's not too much of an exciting story. I tripped over my own feet. I won't get into it because it's a little embarrassing. But um, I got a cool sandal, so that's cool. But um, that first week, it's been pretty much more of a mental battle rather than a physical battle, in my opinion. Um, that first week was really just me in my bed saying, why me, why me? And um, I went through pretty much just like a big depressive episode, and I didn't think I was going to come out of that because I'm in a musical right now, and they told me, yeah, about four weeks. But then I was told six weeks, and you're given all these timelines, and you don't know when it's going to heal. And so I was just digging myself into this pit where I was just like, why me? I can't do this anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was just sitting in my bed, lights off, crying all the time. And I didn't know where I was going to turn. And so one night, I remember it was after I was like talking with my mom. I was sobbing. And I, I was alone in my room finally about to go to bed. And I just felt this tap on my spirit. And it was like, hey, my child, look over here. And um, God really touched my spirit that night. And he said, open your devotional book. My mom recently... Um, bought me a Sadie Robertson Live on Purpose uh, devotional book. Really good. Um, but he told me to just open that up, and I opened up to the fourth entry, and it was called um, Faith for the Vision. And it basically started with Matthew 14, 31, where Peter's being pulled out of the water, and he says, oh, you of little faith. And that spoke to my spirit so hard, and Jesus touched me that night. And ever since then, I was just told, you need to pray and just pray with conviction. Amen. And you can pray and you can believe everything that you want, but if you pray without faith, if you pray without belief, then the Lord says, like, where, where is your prayer? Where is your faith? And I just found this calling from God saying, if you're going to pray, you need to believe in that prayer. Amen. And mm -hmm. I just have been persistently praying over my foot. And in a little under two weeks, I have been able to walk perfectly with a brace and the only person that brought me here was God. And I tell that to myself every morning. I look myself in the mirror and say, you need to thank God for how you're walking today. Because Amen. I have to tap dance in a month, and I know I'm going to be do it by the power of God. Amen. And <laughs> I'm not a tap dancer at all, but the Lord is going to will me to do it. Um, even if that foot is still not healed, I'm going to be praising God through that brokenness. Amen. And that's what God has really shown me through this battle. He put me through this mental battle pit of just darkness and he said I'm your light and you can see that because light is always winning over darkness and you can always see that match in the darkness and that matches him and he told me look at that keep your eyes on me my child just as Peter did on the water and you will walk amen and that's what I just amen. believe every morning so I thank God <laughs> I think it was over there I think so yeah. Praise him through the brokenness. What, a, what an awesome word, right? Lexi just described to us what faith is, right? Didn't she? Yeah. Ephesians 3 is about midway through um, my sermon today, and it's just been kind of resonating, so I need to release this, and I'll see if I get back to the forefront of this or not. But this scripture um, is one that we constantly quote here. And so it's just been something I've been hitting with the youth because um, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. And um, this scripture in Ephesians 3.20, you know it. Um, if you want to turn there, uh, go ahead. If you can put it up there, he will. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Say immeasurably more. Father, I know I'm getting into prayer, I'm kind of offbeat right now, but Father, I pray that we would believe in immeasurably more. That Father, through the brokenness, we would learn how to praise you. Father, that we are so limited, being finite thinkers, God, just having not that infinite thought process that you have, Lord. Your wisdom is so unreachable and unobtainable sometimes, we feel like, but that's not what your word declares. It rains down upon us. 
Father, I pray that we would just get a glimpse of your glory like Moses said. Father, I pray that we would be so hunger, that we would so hunger for you, Lord, that we wouldn't hunger for the unrighteous things of this life any longer, that we wouldn't look for a path that is obtainable of human glory. Father, in all avenues of our lives, God, that we would be struck by your awesomeness and your beauty. Father, and to know that name of Jesus and to know that we can petition you through that name, Lord. Who else can we go to? Who else can we turn to, Father? So through your Son and through the blood of Jesus, we believe in immeasurably more today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. I want you to think about that word immeasurably. Once again, this is off pace. This isn't how I want to start my sermon. I want you to think about that word immeasurably because we are such finite thinkers. We say things like, the sky's the limit. Or how deep is the pool to know whether or not we can jump in? How tall are they? How wide are they? You know, people have preferences. We ask things like the distance. How far do we have to go? And what that does is that gives us a unit of measurement to understand something's limit, right? I am latitude and longitude. I, I'm limited both ways in my physical being. And so is my understanding. When we read that God is immeasurably more, when we read that there is no limit that you can put on him and what he can do, then there's times where we, I'm asking you right now, what are you praying for? What are you believing God for? The creator of the universe. We become so limited in our finite way of thinking because of the way people have spoken to us, because of, of the brokenness of our lives. We just expect less from people. And inadvertently, at times, we expect less from the Creator. He can do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. Adelaide, we were at uh, Sky Zone two years ago, so she would have been, I think, eight, eight or so. And if you watch American Ninja Warrior, they have these warped walls. And what that is, if you've never seen it before, is they have, I think it's a 14 foot, 14 and a half foot warped wall in the American Ninja Warrior thing. And so you're not jumping 14 and a half feet to reach this. Uh, what you're doing is you're running up the warped wall a little bit, and then you're leaping to see if you can, from however, like five, six feet up to see if you can grab it on the warped wall, the top of it. And at Sky Zone, what they had is they have like an eight, a 10, and a 12 foot. And I think at this one, they had a 10 and a 12 foot one. And so Adelaide was grabbing the 10 foot one at eight years old pretty easily. And it's not, it's not crazy complicated, but she was running up and grabbing it. And, uh, and then she starts going on the 12 and a half foot one. And I start telling her, you know, and she's falling short. She's like, she keeps falling down. And so I'm watching her do this. And I'm just so proud of her efforts because she's not quitting. And I tell her, Adelaide, babe, I'm like, you might not get this today, but if you keep trying, if you keep persisting, then maybe next year or the year after when we come to this point, maybe you can grab the top of that. I can see it will happen because she's just that persistent and stubborn. Like I would say her mother, but I'm gonna say her daddy because I'm gonna stay in grace, Becky's good graces today. <laughs> she's persistent, she's stubborn. I inadvertently had put limitations on my daughter because she grabbed it that day. 12 and a half feet. She grabbed the top of that wall and I was elated that she was willing to break free of the un unintentional but self-imposed mentally debilitating limitations that I put on her, not intentionally. And if she had accepted that and just accepted this is as far as I can go for now, she wouldn't have grabbed the wall and I wouldn't have rejoiced with her. Your father rejoices with you. When you shed off self-imposed limitations, mentally debilitating limitations that, you've, that, that the world or yourself have just accepted as, as being matter of fact for you in your life. And right now, I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to encourage you that you have a heavenly father who can do immeasurably more than you can ask or you can imagine. So that tells us what? That this scripture here indicates an active and fruitful prayer life an active engagement with the Father, right? It's not like what Lexi described, and actually it was in my notes before she said it, where we're just kind of 
sitting back, wallowing in our sorrows, just saying, please notice me, God. No, it's about taking up that cross. It is about being intentionally engaging with the Father. It is about not avoiding the hard conversation to ask him for things because he already knows what you need is what Jesus said, right? He already knows the necessity. I don't need someone to tell me my necessity. When they point it out, I just, did I make it that painfully obvious? Right? Sometimes we vocalize our necessity. We vocalize our hurt so much more. Lexi described my journey right now. What I'm going through with some certain things. And I'm not, I'm realizing right now that I am leaning on his promises for certain things. I'm not going to lean on my own worry or concern. Remember I preached on that last time. I said I'm leaving things at the door. It is a battle. Because that stuff wants to dictate you. When you say, I'm going to pray over this, you're taking authority. And you're giving direction to the thing that wants to dictate you, right? You're saying, I no longer am going to allow this to dictate me into this inner mode of just weeping and wallowing. And I get it. It's real. I've been there many times. Self-imposed limitations will stop your advancement. And if you're mentally disabling yourself from believing this thing, then you believe the lie. It's time that we start believing in a God that can do immeasurably more than we can. What? ask or imagine this this is showing me how my prayer life is is t- tells me how much i believe in him that's what we just read if i believe that he can do immeasurably more am i putting limitation on him because at times we're praying to god and we're asking him for things and we end it with a disbelief like this isn't going to happen That is not faith. Faith is belief. It is praying. It is interactive. It is is action. It is putting action to words. It is, God, I might not see it now, but I'm declaring it for later, Lord. So I encourage you today, going back to the beginning, Nate, I'm going to encourage you today to aim for what is highest. There's a video I'm going to show in just a sec, Nate, if you can put it up. Um, There was a, a quote by this gentleman. You guys maybe know him, Jordan Peterson. I think he's a psychologist, but I don't think he was saved at first. And so this man is so much more highly intelligent than me in an earthly. I mean, I've constantly got a monkey with symbols clanging in my head. So if I'm ever daydreaming, it's nothing, nothing too wise is conjuring up here. I'm just in a daydream mode. And so what I, why I'm telling you this is because these words that you're going to hear, he starts talking about the Bible, and then he kind of like trails off, and then he reigns in this thought of, of focusing on what's highest. Um, But why I'm telling you this is because if I don't intently engage this, then I can get lost in what he's saying. I'll hit it, what he's saying, in just a moment. But I really want you to focus on what he's saying and let it encourage you today. You don't have it. Oh, they don't have it. (laughs) You know what? Then I'll, I'll read the quote to you that I have down here. I did write one of his quotes down. He says, actually, you know what? Let me give you the forerunning thought. He was talking about how the Bible is the precondition to truth. And what that means is that without the Bible, we have no truth. The Bible being the precondition to truth means that from the Bible, from the word of God, truth manifests itself. That's how we can discover whether or not I'm speaking truth or a lie to you, is that it's got to come from a source, right? It has to. And so in this thought process, um, he says, oh, you know what? It just this went up on me. Let me try to find this again really quick. Oh, of course, I'm not going to find the quote now. <laughs> of course, things are connected with this. Um, he says, we aim for what's highest or we don't. We aim for what's highest jointly or we're divided. We aim at what's highest and that gives meaning to all that we do that is subordinate to that. We aim for what's highest, and that's what collects us and gives us structure and all of that. And what he's saying to us is that innately, we don't want to settle for second place. We don't train to to expect to get second place, unless you know your team well and you're just like, oh, if we get it, we'll be happy. But fighters fight for the title belt, right? Families typically starting out are in it for the longevity, right? We're not trying to settle for brokenness. There's something innate within us that gives everything purpose. 
everything that, that gives every small gesture or every small action or even the smallest person that made the team has a purpose and that is to achieve that which is the greater goal and I'm encouraging you to believe in a God that can do immeasurably more than you can speak or you can think of right and then therefore if that is your highest thought if that's your highest prayer everything you do is that is subordinate to that suddenly has purpose and meaning right everything becomes empowered or debilitating. It's equipping or debilitating, depending on what it is that, that we are praying for and believing for. Isaiah 55, starting in verses 6 to 9. This is a scripture that we know well. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Now, I want you to understand this scripture. This is not about us being abandoned. This isn't about us forsaking something and then having nothing. A lot of times when we hear these two scriptures, they're almost separated. And so what I want to get to the point of is understanding what, what the Lord is declaring to us. It says then, let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and our God, for he will freely pardon. Say freely pardon. You don't owe him. Jesus paid the price for you, right? He loves you. He loves you. He's going to freely pardon you. He's going to have mercy on you. If we just turn to him and we start to, start to expect greater for ourselves, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now this scripture is not obscure. It's commonly recited in times of uncertainty. At funerals, we use this just, or, or as a mode of comfort. This scripture is about reconciliation. Because listen to what it continues to say. He's saying, as the rain, so let me read this. I'm going to get back into the thought. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And a lot of times in my spirit, that's where I keep them. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, I think that they stay up there with him. Hear what he speaks. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for what I sent it. This scripture is about reconciliation. It's about redemption. It's about me forsaking all the patterns and the habits that were leading me to a, on a path of destruction, forsaking that and embracing his word. He said his word comes down and waters the seed that is inside of you. So I'm encouraging you today to aim for the highest engagement, aim for the highest praise given and received, and to aim for the highest knowledge. I'm not saying these are three points I'm going to get. They're just ideas I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present to you. What do I mean by the highest engagement? We were created... For connectivity, it is not good for man to be alone, right? That wasn't an observation the Lord made. It was a declaration. He didn't see Adam by himself and just think, oh, this ain't good. And if you ever left a teenager home alone, you know it's not good, right? <laughs> Especially a teenage boy. I had to get creative, and I almost blew up our oven once. <laughs> many, many things happened. And we are created for connectivity. The very idea that my beautiful bride would, would find something attractive in this bum has confounded the wisest for years. But we were created for it. The issue is too many horizontal engagements this way have robbed us of our vertical approach. We stop believing. And I'm not, I'm not talking, I'm not declaring this. I'm saying at times you might not believe in a God that can do immeasurably more because you've settled for measurably less. People have declared things in your heart and you've accepted them as truth, right? That are not true. They're not a manifestation of the word meant to water the seed sown. And those are the things typically we brand ourselves with is that type of hurt. So aim for the highest praise given and received was the second thing because engagement involves investment. When I engage this way, I invest of myself. I invest of myself to you. 
because the engagement involves investment, at times we do expect return, right? If, I'm going to tell you this, hear me. If you allow fleshly vessels the access to build you up, you inadvertently give fleshly vessels the access to tear you down. If you become depending on man to build you up, man will easily be able to tear you down, right? And now a little while ago, I preached on this, like we just kind of strive for that accolades from the people that we try to impress. Why? Why, Lord, would I ever not want to impress your heart first, Lord? So aim for the highest knowledge. The word of God is the highest source of wisdom. As you know, the world is a swamp of confusion. And Jesus told us if we tried to find ourselves in that swamp, we'd become lost, right? But if we lose ourselves in him, we'll be found, right? So before we get into the encouragement part of this, where, where I'll end up closing later in a, in a few, I want you to understand the ability that you have through the accessibility of the Father. Because it's easy for me to give like a spiritually motivating speech. It's easy for that to happen. You got this, girl, or man up, man. And a lot of times, those are the things that limit us. Because how, how is that possible? Because we are in a dig deeper inside yourself culture, not a dig deeper in the word culture, not a dig deeper in the father culture. The Bible says that apart from him, we can do nothing, right? So if somebody tells me to man up, I mean, I'm going to take that as like a slap to the face, but <laughs> it's all good. But I mean, if I were to like let that be my mantra, that's what drives me, that's what gives me my identity, then all of a sudden I become limited in my expression as a man because we all know that men can't express emotion, right? We all know that men can't be honest. We all know that the man, especially in today's culture, has a very feminine, uh, he's a feminine product now, right? Masculinity is called toxic, Right? We were riding in the church van last week. Zoe says, I smell something toxic. And I was like, it's probably my masculinity. <laughs> Needless to say, nobody agreed. <laughs> we ride in a toxic van. That's awesome. <laughs> Years of youth activities. I want you to understand that God is just not some deist being. Deism is the belief that God created you, but he wants to know intervention, intercession, interaction with you. God is not some deist being and the very idea that we have this desire for connectivity proves otherwise. So where am I gonna start just briefly to get to where I wanna go? Youth that have been coming uh, to service, you're gonna, you're gonna, this is gonna sound familiar to you. I want you to understand how the Father sees you because when he wants to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine, that's just not empty words. It's in the word of God. The apostle Paul wrote that. Anointed through the Holy Spirit. And, and the, so the Holy Spirit wants you to remember that you can have immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. So stop settling for self-imposed or man-made limitations. Immeasurably more. I, the more I think about it, it means that he has no depth. He has no height. He has no width. He is immeasurably vast in his being, and he can do that for you if you would just pray it and ask for it. But you've got to be willing to go to the Father. Shove off and shove aside the things that are in your mind. And this is coming from my journey this past week, week and a half. That when I said that I was going to pray for something, guess what happened? an interruption in my body that was going to say, no, you're going to actually go back to worry and doubt and insecurity and all these other things that you declared you weren't going to go back to. And so in the, in the secret place, and I tell Becky like I'm praising him, I'll be at the dinner table and I'll be like, Jesus, and I put my hands up. And now he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm worshiping, I'm worshiping, baby. I'm just giving him praise in a moment because I, every time I'm starting to see that stuff start to creep in, I'm saying the name of Jesus. Every time I start to see that my thoughts are not in the boundaries of the word, I'm claiming the word over them. And so what that is is disciplining my heart and my mind to come back to the place of total and complete surrender to his will to where I can accept things that I couldn't accept outside of that does that make sense please tell me it does the Holy Spirit hear me here this is where we're going to get into seeing how the father sees you the Holy Spirit is God's seal on your life it's heaven stamp the highest stamp coming down on you Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 says, you were included in Christ. Once again, reconciliation. You were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal 
Everyone say seal. seal. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When I was young, we branded ourselves with the Kmart special. I think that's where you got the Olajuwon pumps from. I, I don't remember. And I tell you what, man, I wore parachute pants better than any fourth grader. It's because no other fourth grader was, was wearing them, and my parents never intervened. I'd see them. I'd be like, those are colorful. Let's wear those. But if we brand ourselves with like Adidas or Nike, we're trying to typically communicate like comfort, athletic. If we brand ourselves with Louis Vuitton, it's still that way we can typically brag about, you know, and just kind of show off like what the, the article of clothes that we have. If we brand ourselves with Columbia, typically it's more outdoorsy things. When you get to the point where you no longer want the Kmart special, like you recognize how much it costs to actually get these things, it's to communicate something, right? And a lot of this is in high school. Like you see that like when somebody's walking around wearing or flaunting a certain branding of clothes, it's so that way they can just brag about having it, right? The scripture just told us that God's word communicates with the seed. When you get to the age where you recognize that you don't want to wear it, you don't want to wear the Kmart special and you just want to kind of start branding things, you start to communicate something. Most of those brands that I named to you, all of them have a seal. It's trademarked. It's copyrighted. It means it belongs to that certain, that certain article of clothes, right? We, pur we purchase things so we can possess them and so that way we can claim them as our own. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 tells you that you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. That price was paid. You were paid for, you were bought for. And you don't think that, he didn't think that this isn't a bad purchase. No, he said, it is me. It's written about me in the scroll. It is his will, right? That the blood of Christ paid for you. But too often, like what I said earlier, we allow those negative things that we've heard in our lives to brand us. And we wear that seal around. Inadequate. Insufficient superior, popular, and these are the things that we, that we declare to people just in our personality, and our persona, or in our attitude. Belief in Jesus, unbelief in Jesus. Too often the engagements that have branded us are what it is that we tattoo in our mind. And I'm going to tell you that in the Old Testament, you read a story of someone named Jacob. What happened to Jacob? He was given a new name, Right? He was branded a, a, a liar. Jacob um, means deceiver, right? He was branded a deceiver. And when he wrestled God, when he wrestled God and he said, I'm not letting you go. Man, what was the last time we wrestled with God like that? I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me because too often we're confused with what blessing is, right? Too often we think of blessing as being monetary, financially, you know, relationally, this way. But what God does is God gives him a new name. He brands him Jacob. May God prevail, right? Listen to what the scripture says to us. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. His seal is on you. His branding is on you. You are sealed. You are God's possession. Do you understand this? Don't we just brag about stuff? You don't think the Father wants to brag about you? Don't we protect our possessions, right? Come on, parents. When was the last time your child said they're touching my stuff, right? That's my possession. That's, that's our life right now. That's why I got worked up. <laughs> Probably happened when I was gone this morning. But people innately want to protect their possessions. And I want you to understand that you are God's possession. You are his, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And often... We buy things, like I said about the Louis Vuitton stuff, we just want to show it off. Listen to what Solomon's, uh, Solomon says, dot net. Listen to what this says. This may explain something about the book of Job. While Job was unique and what happened to him was extreme, why shouldn't we learn a general lesson that applies to us all? And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is no one like him on earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away, turns away from evil. That's Job 1, 8 through 9. This is still that, that, um, uh, that website. Clearly God wants to boast about us. Is this not what the Apostle Paul writes about every genuine believer? In Romans 2, 29, it says, his praise is not from man, but from God. 
aim for the highest praise given as well as received. Paul's statement is focused on the temptation to acquire human approval, but it assumes that there is another source of approval available, right? God wants to praise us, right? Such a praise is not from man, but from God. Why is it so hard for us to understand that? Why is it so hard for us to really grasp that the Father rejoices when we turn away? Don't the angels rejoice? And we're like, oh yeah, 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 absolutely. You don't think that comes from the Father? You don't think he's the one leading the party? You don't think he's the one that's celebrating? See, we have an internal compass that directs us heavenward. Until we aim to achieve the highest connection, we're going to be settling for less than what the Father is offering. Aim for the highest knowledge. Psalm 139, 1 through 6 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Now, this is knowledge. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. This is knowledge coming from a heavenly source. When I need direction or connection, I can seek it out from those whom I do trust. But Lord, 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 you know my heart. You know me so well, Lord. Why would I connect here, but yet in the process reject here? Because a lot of times what I'm doing when I'm engaging this way is I'm just looking for affirmation to something I've decided to do, right? A lot of times when I tell my part of the story, it's because I want to feel justified in what I did. So when I connect here, suddenly there's a correction that might need to happen that I'm trying to avoid the conversation with, right? Lord, you know this heart. Why would I connect here but reject here? His, he knows our attitudes, our personality, our ambition, our desire. All comes from his ways and thoughts being above ours. Why would we not seek out that knowledge? You have searched me. You know when I sit and I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Aiming for what's highest. When we decide to do this, it unifies us. It unifies a people. It gives community purpose. It gives team unity. It gives individuals purpose to a solitary event, what it is that you're trying to pursue. When I decide that I as an individual am gonna aim for the highest, all of a sudden I'm more intent with my relationships. When I decide that I'm not the ultimate source, when it ends with my pleasure, or if it ends with my name being exalted, then all of a sudden, if I'm aiming for the highest source, then I'm elevating others to come along with me. This is what unifies the church, is that we are not trying to please ourselves, that we haven't given ourselves some man-made or, or idea or fantasy that we're just going to kind of be a self-consuming entity. What we've decided is that we're going to touch the kingdom, right? And that gives every business... It gives every family, it gives every individual from the nursery from, uh, on up to the seniors, uh, senior saints and everywhere in between. Suddenly we're striving for that ambition. Suddenly we're striving for that purpose. It elevates the minor details. There's a word in church culture. Nate, you don't have to put this up. And I'm just going to hit this really quick. I didn't even know it existed until uh, Gordy had mentioned it to me. It's called deconstruction. And what this is, is has anybody heard of deconstruction? It's actually pretty popular right now. What it is, is its intent is to uh, basically destroy your faith. The idea is that you go back and you, and you, as an individual, you start to deconstruct what it is, why you are where you are today, and why it is that you believe what you believe. This works adversely to what the kingdom is supposed to do, right? I told Gordy when I was talking to him that I think about that like my marriage, Right? Like if I was to deconstruct and come, how do we get to the place where we are? Let's go back to dating. All of a sudden, the hand-holding, the attempts to get her attention obnoxiously at times, <laughs> all that stuff had purpose, right? It's because I wanted to marry her, right? If I deconstruct my marriage and I say, okay, the issue then becomes, did I stop doing that? Did I stop trying to get the affection? Did I stop trying to get the attention? Because in faith, if you, can, if you can see the point where you stopped, surrender, asking, praising, praying, if you can come to a point, that's when deconstruction started in your life, not now. If you stopped the connectivity, then you, then you lost the connection, right? If you, stopped the, if you stopped the interaction, then you've lost the connection. 
But if you go back and you're saying, man, in my lowest of lows, he dwelt with me. When I was in the valley and I felt there was none other, there was just this supernatural peace that transcended everything else that was being pushed into my head. Well, if you go back further and you say, man, there was a time when this relative was sick and we weren't, we weren't seeing what we wanted to see, but I still believed, I still prayed, I still prayed, then that deconstruction mentality and attitude should not in, inhabit your spirit at all, church. You come to a place of saying, you know why I praise him? You know why I worship him? Because he's never left me. He promised to never leave me or forsake me, and he's still with me today, and I'm still believing in him. Why am I praying these things? Why am I praying these specific things for my life? Because he tells me to. He invites me to. And I'm not going to allow my mind anymore to work adversely to his work. The worst battle, the, the hardest battle for us to fight is between the ears, right? That's the hardest battle for any one of us. And so when I decide that I'm going to take his invitation and I'm going to ask for these things, listen to what Jesus says in our worst case scenario. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. In Matthew 21, 22, he says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for. What? In prayer, right? Not just laying there and just saying, oh God, recognize me in my misery. No, an activated, faithful prayer life will produce fruit for you if you decide you're going to activate it. And if you're going to believe for it, then you will receive it. Matthew 9, 29, listen, he, this is still what Jesus is telling us to do. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you, Right? Scripture after scripture after scripture of Jesus saying, if you ask, you're going to receive. Knock, it's going to be answered. Receive as you believe, but you've got to be willing to ask him for it. Your faith is your literal shield in battle. It's what scripture tells us. You lay that shield down, you are susceptible to the flaming darts of the enemy, right? Active faith prays. So activate your faith today. Brian, can I get you to come on up? Listen to me, church. Are you sick? I want you to raise the, raise the wall, right? Stop shooting for the, for the, what I say, 12-foot wall when you can go over the top. Stop limiting yourself and your belief for the Father, right? Raise the wall up. Say, that wall's too small. That belief is too small. It's too small for my God, but he's going to do it because he said he would, Right? He's actually not only going to accomplish it, he's going to do immeasurably more than what he said. So I'm, I'm telling you, whatever you decided for yourself, stop it right now and raise the expectation. Because he says he's going to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. Are you sick? Expect a healing. Are you depressed? Expect God to give you joy. That is the essence of faith. If you're down, expect to be up. Now, hear, hear me here. This is a direction for some of you, maybe one of you. I don't care. If you are glorifying emotion, you are debilitating your spirit. If you're, if you're to a point, like when I was in high school and I was in love, I would listen to R&B Boys to Men and I would like write poems and stuff. When I was going to work out or go to play sports, I'd listen to hard rock music. I was glorifying emotion. And what I would allow myself to do is my mind would just entertain thoughts. There's no boundaries there right why do you think we glorify emotion so we can feel more why do you think we praise jesus why do you think worship is essential to take us beyond what the emotions try to dictate us to do and we're saying i'm giving direction to this in my sorrow i mean there might be weeping tonight but joy is going to come in the morning church right there might be sickness right now but health is on the horizon right you might feel alone right now but help is on its way because jesus promised to fill you he promised to sustain you through his word are you believing it today then let's stand and let's go ahead and put our hands up as, as brian starts to play and let's just worship him are you believing for immeasurably more put your hands up for me if you're believing for something father i pray thank you jesus you know what church these altars are open right now if you want to come late at the altar this is part of that approach come on up and let's pray and believe together come on up your hands are so many hands up come on don't stay let's move forward now's not the time to release it now's not the time to let it stay where you are let's move forward